So as a functional medicine doctor, I should probably stop telling all of my patients on Eliquis and Aspirin or Eliquis and Plavix to stop all of that and start six grams of Omega because it's a blood thinner. But um, as we'll talk about, it kind of does line up at least directionally somewhat with some of the other data that's out there. Um, there were really four big randomized controlled trials that I think led to this. So you had number one, the OMINI trial showed an increased risk of AFib 7.2% versus 4%. Uh, this was uh, 759 patients, and this was their risk of AFib. So that was, I believe, it's like a 1.8 something hazard ratio is what spun out of there. Mm -hmm. Then you had the STRENGTH trial also showing increased risk of AFib 2.2% versus 1.3%. Over 13,000 patients, then yep. you had reduce it. Um, this is interesting because this is the one that showed the strongest protective effect. I think the reduced incidence of MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, was in the range of 25% with this one. Yep. And AFib incidence was increased 3.1% versus 2.1%. And these are absolute risks. So this is relatively small absolute risk, but a pretty substantial relative, relative risk. risk. Yeah, so depending on if you're pro-omega or anti-omega, you say it's a 1% absolute risk or a 80%, yeah. Or if you're yeah. talking about the omini, it could be as high as an 80% relative yeah. risk increase. Or, or that if you're anti-omega, of course, we're here for a balanced approach to health. Um, so if you think about it, you're, you're thinking about the dose and you're also keeping into context what the indication of the omegas are. So I guess our job is not to sit here and say, oh, when we put uh, omegas on the overrated supplement podcast, if people remember we did overrated supplements and you know, uh, partly to click to get views, but also partly because with the many benefits of omegas, mega dosing omegas is overrated for general cardiovascular health and uh, AFib risk is part of that. Yeah, even in these four trials, the fourth being the vital, which did have a hazard ratio of 1.09. So it was supposedly not statistically significant. This was the lowest dosed omega-3 trial. Um, so it was considered a neutral finding. I don't believe it also, I don't believe it showed any improvements in adverse cardiovascular events either. So the trials are mixed. So if if you do have a cardiologist that says, hey, you should be on Vasipa, they're probably thinking to themselves, this person's gonna like potentially walk out the door and have a heart attack on me. We wanna put everything we can in their corner to hedge against that happening. That's probably a good choice. If you are taking six or seven grams of omega-3s just because you heard your favorite influencer is doing that or mm. some company told you you should be doing that, then that probably needs to be evaluated in the you know, context of what is your risk for AFib. Do you have any other health conditions that could this is, could sort of be the catalyst to flip you over into a, a atrial arrhythmia. So as a functional medicine doctor, I should probably stop telling all of my patients on Eliquis and Aspirin or Eliquis and Plavix to stop all of that and start six grams of Omega okay. because it's a blood thinner. Because my surgeon told me to stop all Omegas and blood thinners before my surgery last week. Yeah, and that's just per protocol. I, I see that a lot. So on the like stop this before your procedure, um, it will say, you know, stop X, you know, your uh, blood thinners, your aspirin, don't take ibuprofen, mm -hmm. St. John's Ward, all these different things. And it'll add omega-3s or fish oil into that. But there's been randomized trials with really hefty doses of combination. So that's the key there. It's not just four grams of EPA, but like a combination of EPA and DHA in the four gram range. And then they take those patients to open heart surgery and they don't see an increased bleeding risk. So... It's just more time efficient for the surgeon to tell everyone, hey, stop your fish oil, than to mm -hmm. say, okay, well, how much EPA are you taking? <laughs> how much DHA are you taking? Uh, surgeons don't really get paid mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, the other way to look at it is it's not as strong as an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet as prescribed anticoagulants and antiplatelets. I did stop my aspirin before my surgery. Good so, choice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're rabbit trailing a bit here. We can move on. Yeah. And then... Another observational studies and looking at some different countries, uh, basically the summary is it needs more research. Um, one showed an increased risk of AFib with more, this is just dietary consumption of fish that was in mm -hmm. younger adults. Uh, one showed a decreased risk in older adults. And then there was another study that showed no change in risk of AFib 
regardless of the dietary fish consumption. So I wouldn't worry at all about like how much fish you're eating and whether that's going to affect your AFib risk. Uh, there's much larger basic principles of diet that I think people should focus on first. And then really just kind of evaluating what you're doing from a supplement standpoint. And we'll kind of talk about what, um, what some of the results are looking at the primary reason people are prescribed omega-3s, which is for reducing the risk of a heart attack, stroke, those sorts of things. So this yeah. is a chart that's showing us the reduction in uh, plaque progression. So you have a group here that was sort of the summary, like the average. Then you have mm -hmm. people taking no EPA, low EPA, and high EPA. And uh, interestingly, in the high EPA group, they included EPA only. Mm -hmm. And then also a combination, basically four grams of ethyl esters as well, mm -hmm. lumped into that category. Yeah, pretty interesting. Um, the difference between the omega-3 ethyl esters, which is usually about half DHA, half EPA. Is that one's generic and affordable, right? Yeah. Um, it's been compared to icosapent ethyl, which is basically just EPA ethyl ester, which is pure EPA. And I suppose if you had a patient that has um, like familial hypertriglyceridemia or uh, extremely high triglycerides, it's also cardiovascular risk, then um, that could make sense, especially if they're not having to take something like niacin or a fibrate in lieu of that. Um, but yeah, compared to it for general health optimization purposes, we actually prefer the mixed omega ethyl esters or the generic Lulazo. Yeah. And again, it's probably for the general healthy person, not a huge, I mean, I don't even know if you could detect that risk, even in a study, large study over several years, yep. but to hedge on the side of caution, that's the approach that we tend to take. So mm -hmm. basically here you see a dose wise progression of, or lack of progression actually. Uh, if you yeah. don't take any EPAs, and these patients are all on standard of care, so statin, aspirin, beta blocker, uh, you don't add any omega-3s and you see their average, again, small numbers, but about 20% uh, plaque progression, so an increase in that atheroma volume. Yeah, have they measured that plaque progression? Surely not something like a CCTA, because cardiologists don't really recommend those. Well, the cardiologists that were involved in this study did. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, not really seeing that in practice yet, yeah. but uh, commonplace among uh, publishers and I guess academic centers. Yeah. And our patient population for the right candidates. And next you have the low EPA dose. So this one, I believe was in the realm of something around one gram, uh, maybe two grams of EPA with no DHA. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a slight reduction, right? 15.7% increase in atheroma volume. And then the EPA high had the smallest increase in progression, 5.6%. Mm -hmm. But what I think is the most interesting is this chart right here below this. So they lumped both high EPA and DHA and high mm -hmm. EPA alone, which is only 1800 milligrams here in, into the same group. Yep. Those on the combo, zero of them had plaque progression. Hmm. Five of the patients had plaque progression on the high EPA alone. So that's it's really interesting to me, and it's not statistically significant because of the small numbers, mm -hmm. but if you have 20 patients on this high dose EPA DHA combo and none of them had plaque progression, that seems to bode pretty well that, and the conclusion from the paper was this, that the DHA is definitely not interfering or minimizing that benefit of the EPA. There's other benefits of EPA that the DHA may attenuate, yeah. but the plaque progression doesn't seem to be one. Yeah, we've talked about other benefits of DHA in the past, I think in our All Things Fats episodes, post-TBI, um, football players, military, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but this is relatively compelling that it is at least non-inferior. Yeah, and if you're looking at just someone like hedging saying, hey, I, you know, I've got a 10% stenosis, I had a CCTA, I know I've got some plaque there. I want to kind of, you know, have all different vectors going to prevent that from going to 20, 30, 40% plaque. Then a combo product could be a reasonable addition. You're not going to be missing out on anything by not taking EPA only. Um, you're not going to have the increased bleeding risk, really. Really, you're just missing or attenuating that effect on the platelets. So if you're looking at like someone with a unstable angina, mm -hmm. then probably adding the DHA to that is not going to be the best risk reward ratio for them in that case. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
I guess another silver lining here is, although insurance won't cover it until you've had a cardiac event um, or a stent, uh, you can still get it for a cheap cash price. Yeah. Or if you have a CCTA, you prove to them that, hey, I have plaque in my arteries and my CAD mm -hmm. rads too. I should have a repeat CCTA by the guidelines at this interval. Mm -hmm. Then they will cover it, which is interesting. I mean, it's a good summary of kind of how our health system works. You prove you're sick so that you can get coverage. Yeah. Prove you're sick out of pocket and then you'll get your meds covered. Maybe. That's a, I still think it's a good investment. Yeah, it is. Especially if you get your PCSK9 covered if you need it. Mm -hmm.